The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. He is my good buddy and fellow car enthusiast, Greg Manorino. Greg, welcome back to the show, my friend. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Dude, let's talk about the yield curve. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, we'll start off with that. I, lo I, I love it. Well, you know, to me, what do, this is nothing but a no confidence vote in yeah, right. the economy. I mean, look, our economy is shit. Can I say that word? I think sure, sure, sure. Let her rip. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, look, and I, this is no secret. I think to anyone who, who who knows what's going on, who follows your work or my work, it's just more. What they're doing is they're fist feeding us crap and dog shit. And, you know, look, um, I think if we understand what's happening, I think we do, uh, we're going to stay on the right side of this. We just got to ride this out. Um, I don't I don't see anything major here. Uh, it's not an epiphany that we're having issues in the yield curve. Uh, I mean, I'm not surprised. I don't think you are or anybody else. This is just a reflection of what is going on, despite the propaganda Period. At the end. I, I I pretty much am ignoring it. I'm focusing more on the ten year yield, and I uh, right now I don't I don't see any red flags anywhere. I think the market is going to continue to get propped up by by more debt, and I think oceans of it are coming much more than we've ever had before. So that's my take on what's happening with regard to the yield curve. I I've been telling my people just don't worry about it at this point. I don't see anything going on. So do you think that debt, that ocean of debt that you're referring to, that's going to come through more government spending? Are you talking about the sovereign balance sheet or the corporate balance sheet or the consumer balance sheet? Or what do you think? Well, I think from right at its core, it's central banks who are going to continue to fuel it. They have to. You know the mechanism here. It's very, very simple. You know, they must continue to inflate They've been doing this since forever. They're not going to stop. It's the mechanism to continue the debt-based economic model from functioning here. People are obviously, you know, consumer debt, household debt taking off uh, like we've never seen before. Inflation is skyrocketing. It's a, it's, a, it's a very, very bad situation for people, unfortunately. They're being, people are being, you know, pressured from every possible direction and then yeah, some. Right. And in my view, I don't see an end in sight here. I don't see it because I don't see the mechanism changing at its core. It's going to continue the way it goes. It's going now. I just, uh, uh, until we hit that climax, that climax here, the, the, the grand finale is to me, and I would imagine yourself, is the, is the debt market. The debt market is going to implode. I don't know when. I don't even care when. I really don't. I'm just, you know, taking advantage of things as I see opportunity come along here. I think the fact that this is being prolonged, like every other crisis is, um, you know, gives people who have a few functioning brain cells the, the, the opportunity to get themselves on the right side of it before we get the implosion in the debt market, which is going to wreck the stock market. And then we're just going to see cash move from one set of assets into another. And we're already seeing it to a certain degree. We've seen commodities take off, although we have had a big pullback recently. Um, but I think that's just a temporary, that's where the market works. You know, no asset class, no asset goes straight up, but a little drop or a big drop and you get a new floor and then we go higher because the debt is going to continue to inflate. That's the core. In my view, I look at things this way. I look at the debt market as the driver of everything. Now, because the debt market is the largest part of the market by exponents, you know, everything derives value from it. So we have a debt market hyper bubble, which is out of control. It's going to get much, much larger, faster, I think, than we've ever seen before. Um, we're going to get other assets continue to inflate and certain things are going to deflate. For example, we, we're seeing the absolute value of the dollar crater. It's going to continue to crater. Um, unfortunately, and I think it's by design, it's a mechanism. I think we all expected this to happen, although I do expect the relative strength of the dollar to stay high, and it has, it, it will, um, for the foreseeable future, uh, un unless some other massive force acts against it, and, and that would be, I mean, obviously, some kind of a world war, maybe, or something along those lines. Yeah, so we got to differentiate between the dollar on the DXY against other foreign currencies, which, to your point, might be stable short term. Uh, and then compartmentalize that with uh, the dollar relative to goods and services here in the United States. And the dollar is just getting crushed, as we know, relative to goods and services. And uh, that's really what matters to the average Joe and Jane. 
So do you think that mechanism that you're talking about with the Fed uh, just keep doing what they're doing? Is that really because they're, you know, tape, they're so-called tapering down to zero. They've done that. Um, do you think that they're just going to keep doing what they're doing in the form of keeping real interest rates negative? Because right now, you know, we're at what, 25 basis points, maybe a little higher between 25 and 50 basis points. But yet we've got a Left. CPI print at 8%. So let's just call it negative real rates at 7.5. And you and I both know that the real rate of inflation is far higher than that. So we've probably got negative 15% interest rates. <laughs> so do you think they're just going to keep uh, moving forward with that game plan? Or do you see them going back to quantitative easing or dropping rates back to zero? All I can tell you is the mechanism in place here is, is deliberate. It's being it's designed to do this, and people are getting crushed. And I do con con consider the fact that it will continue in this manner. These incremental raises in the federal funds rate, it's a joke. It's a joke. Yeah, yeah. When you look at all the things that you had just pointed out, as a matter of fact, just this morning, what did we get? We found out that uh, wages are rising at 0.4% last month, and we have the uh, inflation, you know, surging higher people are getting robbed blind and this mechanism of grand theft on an unimaginable scale is going to continue and continue and in my view it's going to get worse that look central banks in my view again and i would I, I would be hard pressed to believe that you don't believe this are going to continue to inflate um their mission is to inflate and they and it's not even look that's the mechanism they must do it um in order to continue to this system functioning. We have to continue to pull debt from the future in greater and greater amounts. It can't be static. It must, it must exponentially increase. And they're going to do things to us and throw things at us, crisis after crisis, uh, expansions of wars and whatever else to make sure that mechanism stays in place. Right. It's not going to stop. And I, I want people who, who follow your, your work and mine to understand that. So that gives people an enormous amount of, of, of power and strength, just realizing the mechanism and how it's in place here, ignoring the propaganda ministry, the mainstream channel, because it's all bullshit. And, and their job is to mislead people, distract them, deflect them from the truth, uh, and, and, and feed them garbage. So th thankfully, there are shows like yours out here that are allowing people to, to get a real handle on what's going on. Because look, to me, this is about it's so much bigger than, than what we see. I want people to embrace the fact that we are all responsible for each other, that we need to, to come together and realize what they're doing to us and weaponize the system against them because they're trying to kill us. I mean, in a literal sense. So if we could flip the tables around here by looking at the situation and say, okay, what do I need to do? Well, that's, I think, what you, you and me are trying to do. We're trying to get people on the right side and keep them there. Yeah, number uh, one, you have to inevitable. be educated and you have to be aware of what's going on. You know, Greg, one story that I was looking at this morning that really highlights exactly what you're saying is the ECB and Christine Lagarde is coming out and saying, well, we were going to lay off the quantitative easing. We were going to lay off the monetary heroin. But right now, we, we might have to pump the brakes on that a little bit because of everything that's going on. Of course, they blame it on Putin. They blame it on Ukraine, Russia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They keep saying that uh, it, they're still holding to this thing that inflation is transitory over there. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you've seen the, the headline numbers of the CPI in Europe, but it's going up at the same rate that it's going up here in the United States. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're basically saying that we're going to continue quantitative easing even though the CPI rate is going higher and higher and higher, and to your point, stealing purchasing power away from the average Joe and Jane. I mean, I want to connect the dots there for people listening, because that's really what you're saying. You're saying that the government's run up all of this debt, and the way that they get rid of that debt is they inflate it away. But that's a, a, but what they're doing, what most people don't realize, is they're, st they're, they're having to take that purchasing power from someone. There is no free lunch. So if the government is going to reduce their debt load or reduce their debt burden, they're going to increase the burden from the average Joe and Jane, from the poor and middle class, through this insidious tax called inflation. Yes. And my point there is they're, they're doing it in the United States. They're doing it in uh, Europe. And in Europe, they're maybe even doing it to a greater degree. And even in Japan, 
Did you see that? You know, they said that they're going to buy an unlimited amount of 10 year treasuries to keep it at 25 basis points, even though their CPI there, their inflation rate is going higher and higher and higher as well. It's a worldwide phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, it is. I'm, I'm so happy you brought that up because that's what I've been telling people too. This is a global phenomenon, what's yeah. happening here. And what the, the European Central Bank is doing here, the Fed's going to follow suit. They, they kind of work in lockstep. Mm -hmm. And you know all the nonsense about, oh yeah, we're going to do this and we're going to do that, just ignore it all. If we understand that the mechanism, again, is they're going to continue to inflate uh, on an unprecedented scale and it's not going to stop and all, you know, all this is, is a massive, epic wealth transfer effect from one group of people to another and elimination of an entire class of people. Right. Um, and it's getting progressively worse faster. You know, people like you and me and, and people who follow our work, I think they've been well aware that and been made aware that this phenomenon would happen from years ago, years and years ago. But now they're seeing it. And I, I, I think, I, I really hope that people are starting to wake up. I think they are. I really do because I hear from more and more people from all over the world, just like you, I'm sure. And people are seeing what's going on. And that raising awareness, like you had just said, I mean, people, that's what they need to do. Become aware of what they're doing and why they are doing it. And um, I think people, again, are starting to realize all this. So that puts them in a tremendous position of strength, at least yeah. knowing what they should be doing moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And then also understanding, I mean, I, I was listening to one of your recent videos and you're talking about the propaganda that's coming out with the mainstream media saying how the U.S. economy is great, how it's, it's booming, you know, just echoing whatever Jerome Powell wants to shove down our throats yeah. or Christine Lagarde over in Europe. And I, I think they're doing the same thing with the, the war in Russia. Uh, it's it's all propaganda. You know, it's, it's propaganda of the West. It's propaganda in Russia. Uh, there, you know, uh, Russia doesn't have a monopoly on propaganda, on media propaganda, that's for sure. Yeah. And uh, so how would you advise or how do you try to sift through all of the nonsense and all the noise coming from the mainstream media to try to figure out where is the truth in all of this? Like, do you have any tricks? The my big, I have one trick. Okay. I know I'm always, I always tell people I'm not a one trick pony, but in one aspect I am. Okay. I look over at the debt market to tell me uh, what's happening. The truth. The, there you go. The key, the debt market is the key to this entire freak show. If you are watching one thing, just one, watch that 10 year yield and you're going to have a really good idea as to what is going to be happening. Uh, look, the stock market is going to wave around up and down and do all kinds of fun things as of late, but it's the debt market that's the driver. The stock market, I've tried to explain this to people, is a derivative of action in the debt market. The debt market is going to continue to inflate. So what do people want to do? What do you want to do? If you realize that you need to be in commodities, hard assets, gold, silver, I, and as you probably well know, I'm a big cryptocurrency advocate. And I think people need to be in cryptos as well. It's just a fraction of their, of their wealth should at least be in cryptos to some capacity. If you want to pick one, say Bitcoin, everyone's familiar with it. All right. There's a lot of them out there, but I mean, I think that's the one that people, you know, Bitcoin, okay. It, it clicks with them, but you know, in, in, in my view here, I look at the bigger picture always. The bigger picture to me is, first of all, the day-to-day -day price action, literally of the stock market or of, of, of metals or of cryptos. I don't even think about it. I really don't. I'm looking further down the pike for the inevitable implosion in the debt market. That's the big one. That's the what everyone's waiting for. I mean, people, you know, are talking about a stock market crash, a stock market crash. Okay, yes, we're going to get one, but it's going to it's not going to start in the stock market. The big one is going to start in the debt market where we're going to see a spike in that 10-year yield, an uncontrolled spike. And that's going to put pressure on the stock market and it's going to sell off. And that cash isn't going to go to money heaven. It's going to just move into commodities, in my view, of suppressed assets, gold, silver, platinum, palladium as well, crude oil, forget about it, uh, other commodities as well. And I think the market cap of cryptos is going to three, four, five times you know, higher from where we are now when this happens. And I think it's going to happen rapidly. So, you know, people always ask me, and I'm sure they ask you too, hey, when's the when's the big meltdown going to occur? Well, you want a clue? Watch watch the 10-year yield. That's the key. The key. So in that respect, yes, maybe I am a one-trick pony because that's the biggest part of this market. 
Well, yeah, I, I agree that, that it's all about the bond market. And it's all about interest rates, especially in the United States, because to your point, the bond market goes down or the yields go up, let's say, you know, the 10 year, just imagine a world where the 10 year, uh, we wake up Monday morning and it's at 10%. Just, <laughs> just as a thought, but seriously, just as a thought experiment for the viewers and listeners, yeah. just think about that for a moment. You know, what would happen to the stock market? And, oh. then, and then take it a step further than what would happen to the purchasing power of the average Joe and Jane or the Americans in aggregate total. And therefore, what would happen to the U.S. economy? Uh, what would happen to the dollar and what would happen to commodity? What would happen to all these things? Mm -hmm. And it's a it's a pretty easy chain of events to predict. It uh, is. So then I love how you said that. a matter of, of what your investment time frame is. Absolutely. That's the, you know, it is simple. And, you know, they, it, this whole thing, it is not hard to understand what's happening and where we are going. So for me, like I was saying, I just kind of look down the pike a little bit, keep myself in the right spots for now. For me, you know, I tell people they should be, you know, investing obviously in anti-debt units. This has been my theme since like forever, but at the same time, taking advantage of the freak show stock market at the same time. You know, if we understand it's going to I believe it's going to continue to get propped up. We have been in a corrective phase since the end of last year. We've gone straight up for, for I don't know, uh, since the meltdown of 08, pretty much. Yeah, since mm -hmm. Dow 6,000, you know, we've had a couple of corrective corrections here, but if you just draw a line, it's pretty much straight. If you go through the middle of it all, so we have a corrective phase here, and I, I don't think it's over yet, but I think that with the promise of more easy money, a lot more, more debt, more QE, whatever else you're going to throw at it, more cri another crisis so they can throw cash at it, the market's going higher, in my view, uh, at least in the short run. And just keep your eye on that 10-year yield, people. Just wait for the spike. Be patient. Sit back. Take advantage of what's going on. Oh, in my view, people should have large cap dividend paying stocks in their portfolio. I have this all listed on my website, traderschoice.net, long-term positions, short-term positions. I have an ETF out there, PDBC, which gives people uh, exposure to commodities. I think they should have that in their portfolio as well. There's a lot of ways to take advantage of this. We just, the main thing is we can't sit back and do nothing. We have to take action. Otherwise, you're going to get destroyed. You're going to let the system destroy you. And I refuse to do that. I will not let it happen to myself. I will not let it happen to people that follow my work, um, period, the end, or your work for that matter. You know, we're keeping these people on the right side of this. I, and I think, I, I really think people are starting to get it. At least I hope so. Well, I think one thing that's really interesting is the, the fact that, yes, we've had an inversion in the curve, and that's a pretty good predictor of recession, but usually it doesn't occur for maybe a year, year and a half, and the stock market continues to go up in the interim. Yes. Also, uh, usually, uh, war is, is unfortunately pretty good for the, the stock market. And uh, you know, to your point, I think the Fed is going to raise rates until something breaks. And uh, if it doesn't break, then they're going to continue to raise rates. But what that means is that uh, as soon as something does break, they'll they'll take the pedal off the brake and start applying more more and more gas. And uh, you know the Fed put most likely uh, isn't over until uh, the bond market says it's over. And so that's why we have to be hyper focused on that uh, on that that ten year Treasury. You know, one of the, going back to what we were saying earlier, one of the tricks I use for trying to figure out what is actually the, the truth in media is I just look at whatever they label disinformation. And, and I know that, okay, we're, we're over the target there. <laughs> this most likely is, is going to be truth in, in six or uh, six months, nine months, something like that. Absolutely true. And that's a great point you brought up. They got people focusing here on the yield curve inversion and they, they want people to think that something's going to happen imminently. And that's just not the case. There's always a, a major lag effect. And I also agree that we're going to see the Fed continue to raise rates moving forward incrementally, incrementally. And, and they're going to also try to convince people of something that is just not going to happen. That is raising rates alone is going to do anything about surging inflation. As a matter of fact, no, the Fed is continuing to fuel it higher. Uh, they are making sure that the benchmark rate stays well below the actual rate of inflation. And you can't, there's no way that that is going to fix 
in any way, the current uh, pace of inflation, in fact, is going to get much worse here. And, and you know, this all this nonsense they were feeding us a couple of weeks back, going back to the propaganda ministry. Oh, yeah, the Fed's going to unwind its balance sheet. How is that going to happen? Who's going to buy the debt? It's, it's not going to, it just can't happen. All right. So the Fed's going to be holding this stuff into maturity, as I think we all know. And, uh, and, and they're going to play games. They're going to do a lot of double talk like they always do. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, but 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 look, they're not. They have no interest whatsoever. The Fed and other central banks in doing a damn thing about inflation uh, or unwinding their balance sheets, for which they can't do anyway, uh, or any real meaningful taper of anything. They're going to continue to buy assets and, and 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 do things that we can't believe under the table, on top of the table, in people's faces, and everything else. I tell people, watch the Fed's balance sheet. Just go to their website. It's right there. You know, you can just go to the Fed's website, balance sheet, and you just see straight up. And that mechanism is not going to stop. And it's, it's, do you think do you think we would get to a point where the Fed would buy stocks? I mean, they've already bought junk debt you know, through a special okay. purpose vehicle. But you think they buy equities? I, of course, I think they're buying equities now too. I think they've been buying equities for years. They have a trading desk, New York Fed. You know what do they do? Have, play games in front of it? You know, they, they laugh. They laugh at us, but we're laughing at them. Ha ha. You know we really are. Look, they can't make this easier for people like you and me and the people that follow our work. Uh, it, it's just too easy. Um, honestly, it's just understanding the mechanism, what they're going to do because they, well, they want to. Um, central banks are continuing their mission to be the lenders and buyers of the last resort. The global takeover. Look, they're the government. They are the real government now. Everything else, they just everything else is just it's just a sideshow act. And uh, they're they they control the global financial system. If they control the global financial system, they control it all, everything. And that's that's really the truth, unfortunately. And I've been telling people we have no representation anymore. It's over. Um, any yeah, resemblance yeah. of the prior system is gone. You know, great. Reminds me of that quote I read uh, recently from uh, Henry Kissinger. He said it's something to the effect. I'm paraphrasing, but he said, "If you control the food, you control the people. If you control the energy, you control the countries. And if you control the money, you control the world." Doesn't well, you know what? That sounds exactly right to me. I never read that, but I couldn't agree more with everything that you had just said from that quote there it's kind of scary and, you know, that, uh, <laughs> Especially it's, from it's him. so insane you know look they, they, these people they leak the truth out there but people are so oblivious look people are kept in a state of struggling in a state of pressure constantly they can't focus on anything other than going out earning a living trying to make ends meet um unfortunately digging themselves in a bigger financial hole um that, and that's what people are doing uh, but uh, you know unfortunately it, that's the mechanism keeping them in that state of mind so they can't be free they can't really see what's going on right in front of their face the truth is always in front of people's faces it's hidden in plain sight and um like i said i'm just so thankful that people like you are trying to get this message out there to people so they can get it they can understand it you know one way i see that 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 brainwashing for lack of a better word uh, really, really um, shining through right now in uh, in recent uh, topics and, and and recent news is we've got the increase in gas prices. Everyone knows that. I, I don't. I haven't been in the U.S. in a couple months, but I'm assuming. I don't know what is it there in Vegas, but maybe four or five bucks a gallon. Yeah, it's about five bucks now. Yeah. Jeez, wow, that's a lot. That's that's incredible. I'm sure in California, it's maybe seven or eight dollars. Uh, yeah, I'm but not sure, but it must be. You've seen in Quebec and in California uh, and in other places how they're talking about just giving people money uh, because the gas price is getting so high. So if the gas price goes up to eight dollars, well, we'll just give you an extra five hundred dollars per year, an extra thousand dollars a year, whatever it is. Right. And. I think the way the reason they can get away with that is because of this brainwashing where people truly believe that money currency uh, is is wealth and yeah. and that's all you need that that fixes the problem. All we need is just more currency units and that fixes every single problem because what they're implying there is that the solution to consumer price inflation is just more money. I mean, obviously, if, if money is wealth and money solves all problems, like we've been brainwashed to think, and I'm not saying money, I should say currency, 
uh, then any problem we have, well, we should just print more money. When in reality, and you know this as well as I do, that the only way to solve an, a, a problem of consumer price inflation is not more money, but it's more stuff. It's more stuff. That's how you solve a problem of higher and higher prices. So, but I, I think the reason they can get away with that, this is my point, is because people have just don't have that financial literacy. And therefore, they've been susceptible to this brainwashing that currency is actual wealth and that solves all the problems. And absolutely. Look, it's a whole thing is a mind screw on a massive scale. Yeah. And I, <laughs> it, it, it really is. It's, it's epic. It's epic. But, I think, you know, what they're trying to do as well is, is make people dependent on the system. Right. Uh, look right. what's going on here. We're going to help you because we love you so much. Mm -hmm. And we're going to throw money at you. And, and, and people like you were just saying, people don't realize that, you know, first of all, when they print cash or you know inflate the currency, how does it actually gain value? How does that dollar that they just created out of thin air or added to a digital scene, where does it get its value from? Is it automatically worth a dollar? No, it's not. It's, it has to steal a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of value from every other existing bill in whatever form it may exist. So you end up continuing to devalue the currency that way. Right. And that's the mechanism here. And that's the way it's gonna go. It's gonna get worse like that. And it, what really bothers me is you don't have a single world leader today that is pointing their finger at the root cause and that is central banks of inflation. Although we did hear right out of the mouth of Jay Powell that inflation is uh, largely a monetary issue monetary issue. But mm -hmm. no, you got them pointing at Russia, you got them pointing at supply chain issues and energy, they will not point their fingers at a central bank. Anyone find that interesting? I yeah, do. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's talking about propaganda, Greg, every single time I read the news, and you read about inflation or price hikes from the administration, they always have to put Putin in front of it. Yeah, Putin well, that's price it. hikes. Putin's gas price hikes, or whatever it is. It's like as if gas wasn't going up prior to the invasion. I mean, it's just such a blatant example of propaganda. It is distractions, deflections. Look yeah, here, right. don't look here. We, I, we that's all we see. You know, I, I don't know about you. I, this stuff, I feel my blood pressure boiling at some point, <laughs> especially like when I'm doing like my video blogs and I just my eyeballs feel like they're gonna explode. I just can't handle it sometimes. You know, it's like wow. But, you know, I guess that's the price to pay. I'm willing to pay it. Yeah, it's just a lot of times ignorance is bliss. So you have yes, to. Yes, isn't it? I mean, it is a cliche, but it, it goes back to kind of that Matrix movie that, you know, do you want to take the red pill or the blue pill? And if you take the red pill, a lot of times it's not easy. Uh, it, it, it comes with quite a bit of stress when your eyes are opened. And a lot of times it's easier just to take that blue pill and just be sedated and just be ignorant to the world around you and just try to live your lives. But, you know, I think a lot of, or, you know, most people, almost all people that watch your channel or my channel are those people that have chosen to take that red pill. Thankfully, and we're getting bigger, you know, we're getting the message out there. Th thank, thanks to everyone that follows our work, you know, get this stuff out there, let people hear this. You know, you know a lot of people, are, are not going to understand it no matter even you know you can tell people water is wet or the sky is blue or whatever it might be and they'll they'll argue against it but once they get that epiphany and you know all of a sudden they go boom it clicks and then they get it oh, like, oh my god that's what's really happening and I, I hope we can get through to more people like that you know we're trying to make a difference in the world you know that's what it's really all about making a difference in the world and we can do this by raising awareness um, and letting people understand what's happening to them. And I don't see, unfortunately, I can't see an end in sight. I don't see it, at least at this point. I think it's going to get worse for people, unfortunately. And I believe when we do get that implosion in the debt market, it's going gonna, it's gonna to wreck people. Uh, I, I, obviously, that's what it's designed to do. Um, massive, very rapid wealth transfer. And people need to be on the right side of it now. Uh, on the right side of it now. And that means, again, you know, getting in assets which are undervalued. And, and um, you talked about commodities. And I wanted to discuss that with you. Uh, I, I think that we could have gone into another commodity super cycle in March or April of 2020. I remember when oil got to whatever it was, negative $38 a barrel. Yeah. <laughs> I think that could have been a bottom, just like we saw a bottom back in 1996. 
Hmm. And I remember I, I, I spoke with Jim Rogers about this, and I just recently listened to his book again, uh, Hot Commodities, that he wrote in 2003, 2004. I think it was published in 2004. And he was talking, uh, and then he set up the, the Rogers Commodity Index, by the way, in 1998. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about, you know, commodities going higher and maybe maxing out around 2015. I think they maxed out about 2011. But usually those super cycles last about uh, 10, 15 years. And when I was listening to his book, every single argument that he was making for from a fundamental standpoint for a, a commodity super cycle back in 2003, I see it all playing out right in front of our eyes again. I mean, it, what he was talking about is playing out to, to the T today in uh, 2020, 2020, 2021, and 2022. So um, I, I have, I'm sure you've done some work on that. What do you think about this idea that we're in another commodity super cycle that will take us, let's say, to 2030, um, you know, when you'll own nothing and you'll be happy, <laughs> right? Or maybe even further. I, I love Jim Rogers. I, I, he was one of the first guys who kind of really got me tuned in. I, I started li here. listening yeah. to that man years ago. And I said, this is a smart guy. And yes, he's absolutely right. I, I, and you're absolutely right, too. Look, I, I there's no doubt in my mind how this will play out. I mean, I've, I've never wavered from this, not even for a split second. We are going to see commodities skyrocket at one point here. And it's just coming down to a simple movement of cash. And uh, are we starting to see it now? I think, you know, look, commodity pri commodities are priced in dollars, okay? And that's what we're seeing a lot of the effect of what what's happening now. It's, uh, it's been wavering around a lot, but obviously much higher. But for me, again, commodities are going to skyrocket when we do get that big movement of cash, leaving the debt market, leaving the stock market, making its way into um, commodities, um, obviously gold, silver included in that platinum, palladium. And um and and again, my view is the market cap of cryptos is gonna. That's really that's really interesting, Greg, because I I you know I always look at it from a standpoint. I'm just writing down some notes here. I always look at it from a standpoint of just strictly supply and demand, but but I haven't even thought about it from a standpoint of capital flows. Yeah, which that's, is just, which that's is what, what it comes down to. to. That, that's me. a really neat take. Yeah, it's that's just how it's gonna. I. Honestly, I can't think of another way that it's going to work. And I, I believe me, I have pondered this upside down, backwards and sideways for many, many, many years. And that's what I've explained to people, how it's going to work. It's just cash. See, right now, look, the market is it's, it's risk on, despite the fact that we're in this corrective phase. We're not even far off of new record highs right now with regard to the market. It's still, in my view, a game of risk, risk on. And that right. means cash right. moving into the equity market based upon what's happening in the debt market. Rates being artificially suppressed from here until kingdom come. But that's going to change. You're going to get risk on. It's going to go to risk off and cash is just going to move. You're just going to move capital flow, like you just said, just going to move into other assets. And I and I think that movement is going to be extremely rapid. It's not going to be a slow burn. You're going to see at one point uh, a rapid spiking in the 10 year yield. And that will, again, melt the market, like you had said earlier. And then that cash is just not going to go to money heaven. It never does. It's just going to move from risk on assets to risk off assets uh, and in other other into other things, too, like cryptos. That's how I see it playing out. And that's what I am preparing myself for. And that's, you know, people say to me, hey, Greg, you know, why, why do you hold gold and silver? It doesn't pay a dividend or anything like that. I happen to like dividend paying stocks. No, it doesn't pay. These things don't pay dividends, but they will pay dividends in the future when we see this move. Why, why, why do I hold cryptocurrencies? Because I think the same thing is going to happen here. Um, I, I, I just can't imagine it's going to work out another way. Could I be wrong? Maybe. But it seems like it's making sense to you. And it makes sense to a lot of people that follow my work that that's how it's going to play out eventually. So I don't think about when it's going to happen. I just know it will at one point. For the, and, and, you know, I tell my, my lions, the people that follow my work, my traders and everything that you, know, you trade the market you have, but you, you, you set yourself up for the future as well at the same right. time. I think we have it covered from every angle. I, I really, really do. Yeah, you know, that's really interesting when, when you think through capital flows in the bond market and the equity market, and you got to realize that if you're holding it, if you're a normal investor right now, not, not a huge financial institution that's probably using that 10-year treasury to, 
somehow engineer their balance sheet. But if you're just a normal investor, you're, you're getting, let's say, 2.5% interest. And so you're, you're getting a, you have a guaranteed loss right yeah. there as of right now at, uh, you know, let's just call it uh, five, six percent per year. And in, in, in real terms or in reality, I should say, uh, you're taking a bigger hit than that in purchasing power if you're going to be using that treasury in the future to buy goods and services, right? Because we know that rate of inflation is a lot higher than the CPI. So that said, think about how many, uh, how much capital is not in the, uh, in the bond market and over in the equity market as a result, uh, even though prices of bonds are very high, uh, there's still a ton of, of capital that's in the equity market as a result of these negative real rates. Mm -hmm. So then the question becomes, how much of that capital would still be in the equity market if we actually had positive real rates? And, and I'm not saying the Fed takes us there, but to your point, you know, you have a blow up in the market and then all of a sudden those 10 year rates need to go positive because uh, the market is going to say, we're going to, if Jerome Powell, if you're not going to squash inflation, we're going to do it for you. And so then if we're at 8% CPI, then the market goes up to nine or 10%. And then that's going to have an equilibrium effect where that's going to suck all that capital out of the equity market back into the bond market. And, uh, and I'm not saying that rates would go back down to 2.5%, uh, but they would be, uh, you know, instead of going to 15 or 20%, now they're still at 10%, but that's sucking all that capital out of the, uh, of the uh, equity market, because now you've got a real yield in, in the bond market that's being forced upon the central planners. Um, it, that's an interesting concept that I really haven't, uh, I hadn't thought through prior to that. It's an amazing thing to, to think about, honestly. The, the question it really is, what, where would the stock market be if we had anywhere near a, a, a normal rates of normal right. yields on the bonds? I mean, right, right. I don't, who knows? It wouldn't be anywhere where we are now. I mean, not even close. I mean, look, I think, I know this, this what, what's gonna end up happening is when we do get that meltdown in the debt market and, and that pressure on the stock market, it's gonna overcorrect. It's gonna overcorrect in a massive way. Mm -hmm. So there, there is going to be deals to, to be made uh, and things to buy, uh, but where's the bottom? No one knows, it's a black hole. You see what, what people don't realize, and maybe, maybe people that follow your work do and people that follow, follow my work have been made aware of this, when, when we had Dow 6,000, that's when the Fed stepped in with QE1. Where was the bottom? No one knows where the actual bottom was. It could have been way lower than that. So we could, we could see a sell-off in this. stuff If we were to get anywhere near what you're talking about with regard to the 10-year yield, we could see an 80% sell-off in the S&P 500. Eight, zero. Um, and what would that mean? Well, to me, I would, I would be buying at an 80% drop in the S&P 500. But it's very possible that we could see that. And all that cash is just going to move. Like I'm, I'm telling people, a tsunami of cash is just going to move into other assets. And it's going to be epic. It's going to be biblical. That's how I've been telling people. It's going to be epic, man. I just Yeah, that, that's a good way to say it. So do you think that um, looking at what's going on with uh, Russia and Ukraine, that obviously we all hope and pray that this comes to an end as, as quickly as possible. But uh, assuming, let's just say that it came to an end in a month. And uh, when it comes to an end, I think, and I'd love to get your take on this as a trader, that uh, the oil price would go down quickly uh, and gold might go down quickly. Uh, commodities might go down as kind of this, uh, you know, oh my gosh, thank goodness it's over. Now we don't have to worry about any of these supply constraints and commodities anymore. But then the market is forgetting that we're in this long-term commodity super cycle. And that could be a very good buying opportunity. Uh, what do you think about that? I think it would be an amazing buying opportunity. Absolutely, it would. I won't change. My strategy is very simple. I, I, I have never deviated from it. I will continue to bet against the debt, become my own central bank, 
um, holding suppressed assets here. Look for any opportunity possible. I do think people need exposure to commodities no matter what. And the, for the long run, they're going much higher, much, 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 much higher. Now, with regard to this current crisis, this war, they're going to drag it out just like they do to every other crisis. Every crisis is engineered like that one over there to allow the mechanism of cash to be thrown at it. Hundreds of billions of dollars have already been thrown at it, and it's going to continue. I've been telling people for the longest time, you know, look at the arms deals that are going on now on the back of this. Mm -hmm. We got right. the large just military spending in the history of the United States going on right now. Nations around the world are now rebuilding their other arsenals here. Um, you know, look, there's a lot of ways to take advantage of it, but this is a game. It's all a game so they can continue to pull cash out of the future, suck it from future generations uh, to sustain where we are. And, they, and it has to continue to grow. If if and when that crisis ends, whenever it may be, I think it's going to expand further first. Um, there'll be another crisis and then another one after that. It's the crisis to crisis to crisis global economy. That's how it runs now. And every crisis right. allows them to just throw more cash at it. Like, you know, what's the solution? More cash, like you were saying. And, uh, and that's what they're going to keep doing. It's not going to stop. Yeah, I mean, um, and isn't, isn't, isn't the, we'll call it the Cerveza sickness is just such a great example of that, right? You go from that crisis. Now you notice the mainstream media isn't talking about that at all. Why? Because we have another crisis uh, that whether it's been engineered or just happened, who knows? Yeah. But we've got another crisis for them to focus on to mm -hmm. give them an excuse uh, to continue to, let's say, quote unquote, print money or at least keep interest rates negative, which bails out the government. Uh, at the expense of the poor and middle class. Absolutely. You know, people think that the job of the government is to help them. It's quite the opposite. The job of the government is to help right. itself. Right. And people don't understand that concept. They think the government, oh, they're so nice. They're going to give me money so I can buy gasoline. Oh, Fantastic. You know, no, it's all a mechanism here to yeah. create. I mean, this is a slave planet. They're creating debt slaves on an unprecedented scale. Uh, most people have a negative net worth uh, and they're, and they're going to dig themselves into a deeper hole, assuring that they will be a slave to that debt um, in perpetuity. It just won't stop for these people. They're going to work until the day they drop dead. Uh, unable to collect on uh, whatever or whatever social program may may exist at the time. The mechanism is so twisted. I mean, we, you and I could probably sit here for 24 hours and go over all this stuff that's going on here. But it's, it's pretty freaking epic, man. You know what we should do one day? I mean, just a suggestion here. We should um, maybe open up this discussion. I don't know if you have the ability, because I don't have the ability to do what you're doing right now to get guests on my show. But maybe we should get like someone like Jim Rogers on board with us and we can all talk about this stuff uh i think it would be pretty cool yeah i mean what we could do on the rebel capitalist channels we could do a live stream uh with Streamyard, and i could get i don't know about jim because th the thing that's tough about talking to jim is he's in singapore so you got to do it at like 10 o'clock at yes night. that's true <laughs> yes. how about michael pento i love him michael pento is a good friend of mine he's really on he understands what's going on although we have a different perspective on a lot of things and that's okay you know it's good to have in fact, that's why I like Michael and I talk is we do have a different perspective on a lot of things and we bounce things off of each other. It's pretty interesting. Uh, we've never done an interview together, but maybe he, do, do you know, you know, Michael Pento. Do you know? I, I, I don't know him that well. Like I don't oh, know. Yeah, well he would I, know good, you. I think I've interviewed him once. Uh, he's a good guy to have on your show and uh, you might want to have him back on here too, especially now because he has, um, he's, He's looking down the pike here in a little shorter term, and he feels like the market is going to take a very substantial hit uh, reasonably soon. Not 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 the seven, eight, nine percent like we're seeing, but a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just I just don't see it right now. Uh, I, I don't see anything more than a normal corrective phase based on the debt market, what it's telling me. But who knows? We'll see how it plays out. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think about the uh you know, with what's happening with with Russia, them demanding rubles for payments of commodities. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, what's big in the news right now is just natural gas. Uh, mm -hmm. But the people who have really been paying attention realize that Russia is saying, well, not just natural gas, uh, but potentially oil, uh, timber, a fertilizer, everything is mm -hmm. going to need to be paid uh, for with rubles. Mm -hmm. And you know what's what's really amazing to me is is the people on social media, the Americans, you know, on social media, are saying how ridiculous this is, 
and how that's market manipulation. And, you know, he shouldn't be able to do that. And I say, well, what do you think the United States has been doing with the petrodollar since 19, what, 72, 73, 74? I mean, <laughs> he's just doing the exact same thing. But, but let's not focus on that. What do you think of that that will do to the dollar long term? Do you think that we're, we're moving away from the petrodollar system? And I know it doesn't happen overnight. But do you think this is kind of the straw that broke the camel's back and it'll start uh, forcing or incentivizing countries to transition out of settling in dollars? It could. We, heard, we just heard from the IMF on this. I think it was yesterday. The IMF had said that they see uh, exactly what you say possibly playing out moving forward. But I'll tell you what right. scares me. You know, the, the whole establishment of the petrodollar system has already cost millions and millions and millions of lives. Uh, and they mm -hmm. will sacrifice millions and millions and millions of more lives to right. keep that system in place here. Um, you know, the ruble has recovered a lot since this whole back. thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's unbelievable, isn't it? And uh, yeah, I don't think people are being told that. Um, people, oh, Russia is in collapse. The ruble's in collapse. I guess what? Not really. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how that plays out moving forward. But that does scare me a lot. Um, the, the, the fact that, the, the, look, the enforcement arm of the Federal Reserve is the U.S. military, period, the end. That's where it really gets its value from being backed by the, the uh, United States Armed Forces, including its nuclear arsenal. Right. So uh, they will point that inward or outward anyone they want to, to make sure that that system stays in place. So we'll see how, how this, uh, this, this plays out moving, moving forward. Uh, I, I personally don't think we're going to end up seeing the dollar lose its reserve status without a major conflict and the, and the loss of tens of millions of lives, unfortunately. Uh, but that's what they'll do if they have to. There's no doubt in my mind at all. Yeah. Greg, for uh, my listeners who want to find out more about what you do, wh where can they go? What's your website, the YouTube channel? I, I think you've probably gotten kicked off by Twitter or you've been kicked off of Twitter by now, but maybe not. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm gone on Twitter uh, and I'm also gone on LinkedIn. Uh, I banned myself from Facebook. I hate, I hate Facebook. So you just go to my website, traderschoice.net, or you can just find me on YouTube, just my name, Gregory Manorino. And uh, I'm pretty easy to find, just like you. And, uh, and thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. And I really think you should get Pinto back on your show. It would be a good idea. Yeah, well, let's do a live stream on the, the Rebel Capitalist channel. And what's cool about the live streams there is we can take callers. That and is very so cool. I can get I could get you on there, Michael, maybe you and Lynette or something like that. We could talk for about 20 minutes and then we could take caller uh, questions live in, in real time. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll maybe have Adriana set that up. That'd be a lot of fun. Be a lot of fun. Definitely. All right, Greg, have a good one, buddy. You too. Thank you. Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Do you enjoy watching these interviews I do for the rebel capitalist show? Well, if so, you would absolutely love Rebel Capitalist Live. This is the conference I do twice per year, and we've had speakers like Robert Kiyosaki, Lynn Alden, Rick Rule, Jeff Snyder, and Dr. Ron Paul, just to name a few. So go to rebelcapitalistlive.com and check out the next event we have scheduled in Miami.